on World News Tonight. Decisive elections. The US midterms are underway, with candidates rallying for whatever support they can muster. Climate hell. Staff warnings and accusations riddle the COP27 summit amidst calls for change. Denied deals. North Korea slams the West on baseless acquisitions of weapons trade with Russia. More details tonight. And aerobatic awe. China's biggest air show opens with dazzling aerobatic performances. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. The last few hours of the U.S. midterm elections voting period were spent decisively by thousands of Americans across the nation as candidates of the election rallied for the final time, pushing for last-minute swinger votes to be in their favor. In the last hours before U.S. midterm elections, candidates were pounding the pavement in a final push to mobilize supporters, many of whom say the issues of inflation, abortion and democracy are on the ballot. Tim Ryan, the Democratic Senate nominee in Ohio, shook hands with voters in Parma on Monday, telling them he's fighting to bring down rising costs. We got to put some money in people's pockets. We got to get these supply chains back that left here for the last 30 or 40 years. Stuff was being made in Asia and other places. Got to bring that stuff home, and that's what we're fighting to do. Weighed down by voter frustrations over rising prices, Democrats fear Tuesday's elections could see them lose control of one or both chambers of Congress. That would spell the end of President Joe Biden's legislative agenda, including Democratic priorities such as abortion rights and climate change. J.D. Vance! Republican Senate hopeful J.D. Vance, who is backed by former President Donald Trump, said he was confident the voters of Ohio will support him. Doing what we need to do, I guarantee we're going to be in a position to win this race, and I think we're going to win it in a big way. But it doesn't happen without every single one of you, okay? After many Republican candidates echoed Trump's baseless claims of fraud in his 2020 election defeat, Biden has warned that a Republican victory could weaken the foundations of U.S. democracy itself. And for some voters, preserving democracy is their top agenda. In Nevada, home to another tight Senate race, former U.S. President Bill Clinton campaigned for incumbent Catherine Cortez Masto, hoping to pull out a win for re-election. She doesn't go around demonizing Republicans. She just gets up and does what she thinks right. The party in the White House historically loses seats in Congress during the midterms, though this year it might take some time for Democrats to assess the full extent of the damage. With the counting of mail-in ballots, experts say it could be days or even weeks before the outcome of some close races and control of Congress is clear. Meanwhile, Elon Musk risks falling out of favor with the major audience of Twitter following his controversial remarks on backing the Republicans in the midterm elections in order to balance powers. The world's richest man in Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, threw his weight behind Republican candidates ahead of Tuesday's U.S. midterm elections, tweeting on Monday that the GOP could use control of Congress to act as a balance against President Joe Biden. Musk directed his Twitter message to what he called independent-minded voters, writing, quote, Shared power curbs the worst excesses of both parties. Therefore, I recommend voting for a Republican Congress, given that the presidency is Democratic. Musk's message to his over 110 million followers represented the first time the head of a major social media platform explicitly endorsed a U.S. political party. And it comes as Musk has faced criticism from some groups who believe his so-called absolutist stance on free speech will increase misinformation on Twitter, leading some advertisers to pull spending from the platform. Musk, also CEO of Tesla, has been critical of the Biden administration and Democrats for their proposals to tax billionaires and give more tax incentives to union-made electric vehicles. Tesla does not have unions at its U.S. factories. Republicans are favored to win a majority in the House of Representatives in Tuesday's elections, with the Senate rated a toss-up by nonpartisan election forecasters. Republicans could use a majority in either chamber to bring Biden's legislative to a halt and launch potentially politically damaging investigations into Biden's administration and family. Musk bought Twitter last month. In one of his first acts, the company laid off half its employees and flagged a drop in ad revenue. But the company's head of safety and integrity said the platform's content moderation capabilities remain in place. 
Now, the UN Secretary General says that we are in a battle for survival, referring to the fight against global warming. World leaders and diplomats have gathered in Egypt for the COP27 climate summit and are urging collective efforts, despite many challenges like the war in Ukraine. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres began his COP27 climate summit speech with a strong message. The UN chief told world leaders on Monday at the UN climate change conference in Egypt that the planet is fast approaching a tipping point that will make climate chaos irreversible. Humanity has a choice, cooperate or perish. It is either a climate solidarity pact or a collective suicide pact. The climate pact the terrorists refers to is one between the world's richest and poorest countries to accelerate a shift from fossil fuels to alternative energy sources. On Monday, Guterres urged the leaders to speed up funding to poorer countries already struggling due to the effects of climate change. The UN chief also emphasized the need for cooperation between the US and China. He called them the two largest economies and said that they have a particular responsibility to join efforts to make the pact a reality. World leaders from more than 100 countries are participating in this week's climate summit. French President Emmanuel Macron and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak were among the leaders who called for collective efforts despite the ongoing war in Ukraine. Putin's abhorrent war in Ukraine and rising energy prices across the world are not a reason to go slow on climate change. They are a reason to act faster. So war should not slow us down. On the contrary, it has to consolidate our own agenda on biodiversity and climate, which are essential. China and India are not participating despite being two of the three most carbon-emitting countries in the world, and U.S. President Joe Biden is expected to come later in the week after the U.S. midterm elections. Raging farm fires in India's northern Punjab state are stoking a pollution emergency in New Delhi, but farmers express their helplessness to curb the practice, saying they cannot afford the alternatives without the government's help. Raging farm fires have become a common sight in northern India, where farmers burn their crop waste to clear their fields during a narrow window and prepare them for the next crop sowing. Farmers in Punjab, also known as India's grain basket, claim they had no other option to get rid of their crop waste. Paramjit Singh, General Secretary of Prominent Farmers Union in Punjab, said that if instead of burning the stubble has to be disposed in any other manner, then that involves a lot of expenditure. India's top court had suggested the federal and state governments should work out a solution along with the farmers, wherein they are paid roughly 2,500 rupees per acre by the state and the rest is contributed by them. But nothing has been implemented in Punjab so far. Smoke from Punjab and Haryana in India's hinterland travels eastward and adds to the pollution in New Delhi, where residents have become accustomed to hazy winter mornings with the sky turning a shade of grey instead of a postcard blue. A filthy smog forms over the Indian capital every winter as cold, heavy air traps construction dust, vehicle emissions and smoke from crop stubble burning in neighbouring states, causing a surge in respiratory illnesses among the city's 20 million people. Russian forces, meanwhile, are kept at bay in Ukraine's eastern frontline cities. However, there are no signs of Russia slowing its offense, with the troops readying for close combat. Ukraine has accused Russia of looting empty homes in the southern city of Kherson and occupying them with troops in civilian clothing. Kyiv officials claim it's part of preparations for close quarters combat in what both sides predict will be one of the war's most important battles. In recent days, Russia has ordered civilians out of the city. Kyiv calls this forced deportation and a war crime. Latest footage released by pro-Kremlin officials shows the last boat taking locals to the left bank of the Dnipro River. Accounts of life under Russian occupation by those who have fled tell of having to hide their phones from troops and the impossibility of contacting the outside world. Russia has imposed martial law and curtailed communications across four Ukrainian regions it proclaimed as its own in September. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin has said 80,000 troops who were part of his mobilization drive are now fighting in the zone of the special military operation, the term Russia uses for its war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian army, meanwhile, claims it's closing in on Kherson. The goal? To destroy Russian logistics and supply chains, rendering their presence there unviable. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. North Korea has slammed allegations that the regime is supplying ammunition to Russia. It says the U.S. claims are groundless and calls Washington's remarks part of its hostile attempt to tarnish the image of the North. Grounds rumors of arms dealings. That's what North Korea is calling Washington's claims that Pyongyang is supplying artillery ammunition to Moscow for its war in Ukraine. According to the North State-run KCNA on Tuesday, citing North Korea's Ministry of National Defense Vice Director of Military Foreign Affairs, the U.S. is persistently spreading false rumors of arms trade between Pyongyang and Moscow. It added that the continued accusations are part of the United States' hostile attempt to tarnish the image of North Korea in the international arena. It also stressed that it does not have any plans to conduct such sales in the future. The latest remarks from the North come as White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby last week said artillery from North Korea to Russia was being moved undercover in shipments to the Middle East or Africa. However, Kirby said that the U.S. did not know whether Russia actually has received the ammunition, but they were trying to monitor the shipments. He also noted that the United States believes a significant number of shells sent is enough to help Russia prolong the war, but not enough to give it an advantage over Ukrainian forces. Back in September, Pyongyang denied Washington's claim that it was planning to provide ammunition to help the Russian military replenish its stockpiles, which were said to be severely depleted by the now eight-month-old war. South Korea now begins an annual military exercise as part of its efforts to be better prepared against Pyongyang's provocations. The regime appears to be exaggerating its capabilities and even claimed to have launched cruise missiles last week. After wrapping up a large-scale combined aerial drill with the U.S. Air Force, South Korea's military kicked off its annual Taeguk exercise on Monday, aimed at countering the North's various nuclear and missile threats. The four-day command post exercise will not involve field training exercises, but instead will be done through computer simulations. It will focus on honing capabilities against potential North Korean threats, with operational commands of the Army, Navy and Air Force taking part. North Korea has strongly criticized the drill, saying it's being held to attack them. Meanwhile, North Korea on Monday said that it fired two cruise missiles last Wednesday, all the way into international waters to the southeast of South Korea. But Seoul says this appears to be false. The North state media claimed that the missiles landed in waters just 80 kilometers off of the south coastal city of Ulsan. But Seoul's military said no such missiles were detected on that day. North Korea's claims are far from the truth according to South Korea and U.S. surveillance and reconnaissance assets. There weren't any such missiles detected by our military. The North also claimed to have mobilized 500 of its warplanes last Friday. But again on that claim, the South's military said it detected only 180 tracks of fighter jets on its radar system. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said this too is likely a fabrication, saying that not all claims made by North on Monday are true. Downing Street has said that talks with France are in their final stages, but the immigration minister has been forced to defend the government's handling of the asylum system, saying that numbers being held in a centre in Kent were now coming down. He is Emmanuel Macron's fourth prime minister, but can Rishi Sunak bring political will where his predecessors haven't? Lots for us to talk about, right? Are we doing a yes. photo over here? Let's go yes. do that, and then, sure. uh, then we'll go and chat. After the chat came the news from the PM spokesperson that a deal over channel crossings is in its final stages. I'm actually leaving this with renewed confidence and optimism that working together with our European partners, we can make a difference, grip this challenge of illegal migration and stop people coming illegally. You ignore legal advice on Manson. But Rishi Sunak was forced today again to defend his Home Secretary. We now start the urgent question. Suela Braverman wasn't in the Commons this afternoon as her minister addressed concerns over conditions at the immigration centre in Manston. The population at Manston has fallen 
from 4,000 individuals to 1,600 in the matter of seven days. That is a very considerable achievement by the Home Secretary, by her officials in the Home Office, and I am proud of that. But what's happening at one immigration centre speaks to something much bigger. Nearly 40,000 have already crossed the channel this year, four times the number two years ago. I know how these cross-border uh, operations work. We would work with France upstream to stop the smugglers in the first place. That's the discussion I would have. I hope it's the discussion that our Prime Minister will have. It certainly looked cordial, and the two leaders have agreed to keep in touch. The new Prime Minister knows his problems at home will require political persuasion abroad. Facebook's Meta is preparing for mass layoffs within the company following unfavourable forecasts on the future of its operations, leading to a loss in stock market value. Meta is planning to begin large-scale layoffs this week that will affect thousands of employees. That's according to the Wall Street Journal, which says announcements are planned as early as Wednesday, citing people familiar with the matter. Meta declined to comment on the report. The Facebook parent in October forecast a weak holiday quarter and significantly higher costs next year, wiping about $67 billion off its stock market value. That added to the value already lost this year, more than half a trillion dollars in all. The disappointing outlook comes as Meta is contending with slowing global economic growth and competition from TikTok. Another big worry concerns its massive spending on the metaverse. Chief Executive Mark Zuckerberg has said he expects the investments to take about a decade to bear fruit. In the meantime, he has had to freeze hiring, shutter projects and reorganise teams to trim costs. The social media company in June cut plans to hire engineers by at least 30%, with Zuckerberg warning employees to brace for an economic downturn. At Meta, Meta shareholder Altimeter Capital Management, in an open letter to Zuckerberg, had previously said the company needs to streamline by cutting jobs and capital expenditure. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Beijing authorities detected 64 new local coronavirus infections, enough to spark a new burst of PCR tests for many of its residents and a lockdown of more buildings, neighborhoods and even districts in some cases. Mexican authorities intercepted over 1.3 tons of packages floating in the Pacific Ocean, believed to contain cocaine. Dozens of packages were found off the Chiapas state's coast in an operation carried out by the Mexican Navy and the Army on the October 30th. Weeping relatives of the 19 people who died when a plane crashed into Lake Victoria in Tanzania filed past a row of coffins in the lakeside town of Bukoba as religious and political leaders gathered for a ceremony to honor the victims. The Council of Fashion Designers of America held its annual award ceremony in New York. The red carpet was filled with celebrity fashion fans and insiders including Kim Kardashian's whose Kim's brand was honored with the first ever Innovation Award. Seven times Formula One world champion Lewis Hamilton was made an honorary citizen of Brazil by the country's lower house of Congress. Hamilton delighted Brazilians by unfurling the Brazilian flag from his Mercedes during a slowing down lap after winning the last year. The Ethiopian government and Tigrayan forces have established a telephone hotline to help maintain a ceasefire struck last week and both sides met in Kenya for the new round of talks on the implementation of the truce. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with visuals of dazzling stunts that wowed spectators at Airshow China 2022. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.